This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for coming out in this weather. I really, really appreciate it. My name is Steve Taylor. I'm on the School of Music Composition faculty. And it's my honor to present to you the, today's guest composer, Stephen Stuckey from Cornell University. This afternoon's presentation is part of the George A. Miller Lecture Series, which brings to campus the best and the brightest each semester. The lecture series is made possible by an endowment from the late Professor George A. Miller, and speakers are chosen on a competitive basis. The presentations, such as today's, are frequently interdisciplinary and involve the support of multiple departments or units on campus. The speakers also engage with the campus community and uh, sometimes the local community. And Mr. Stuckey's actually talking with several students from around the campus, and he's staying at Unit 1 in our dormitory, Allen Hall. And this provides a wonderful opportunity for students and people in the town to meet guests. We have support not only from the School of Music today, but from political science, from the Department of History, from Unit 1 in Allen Hall, and several other units on campus, including the Center for Advanced Study, which supervises the Miller Com Lecture Series. Stephen Stuckey, the given professor of music at Cornell University, first became prominent in the 1980s for two different things. He published a book on the famous Polish composer Witold Dudoslawski, which won the Deems Taylor Award from ASCAP, one of the highest awards given to a book published on music. And then he also, in the mid-80s, uh, composed his first concerto for orchestra for the Philadelphia Orchestra, directed by Ricardo Muti, who I just found out today actually solfeged every single note of that piece to learn it. <clears throat> and um, since then, Mr. Stuckey has been involved with many of the leading orchestras in the United States. Um, from 19... 88 to 2009, he was a resident composer for the LA Philharmonic, where he worked very closely with Esopeka Salonen. And for the past five years, he has been the host of the Here and Now series at the New York Philharmonic. Today, he's going to be talking about a piece that was commissioned by the Dallas Symphony based on the President LBJ, and it's called August 4th, 1964. I hope you please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody. How's this? Uh, two, two caveats. Uh, first, you'll be as disappointed as I am to know that the music we've just been listening to was not composed by me. And uh, now that I know that there are political sciences, scientists and historians in the audience, I'm in trouble uh, because I'm not one. But, uh, but I'll bring my musician's uh, brain and heart to this subject today. The implications of the published title, Music and Politics, um, and the implications of my private subtitle, A Composer Confronts His History, will let lie fallow for the moment, but I promise to return to them later. First, I want to tell you a story. A few years ago, I was asked to do a project that will lead us, by and by, back to the necessity of confronting politics and history, confronting the history of music, past and recent past, and confronting my own personal history. In 2006, I was offered a commission by the Dallas Symphony to compose an evening-length work to mark the centennial of the birth of Lyndon Baines Johnson. The LBJ birthday would fall in August 2008, the premiere of the new work in September 2008. My every instinct was to recoil. First, from its unsavory subject, LBJ, from the fact that that subject seemed too specific, too parochial, a dead end, unlikely to be useful in other venues on other occasions. The opportunities to embarrass myself seemed legion. The chances of coming out with my honor and self-respect intact seemed remote. But for reasons I can describe later, if you like, I did accept. And in the course of pursuing this project, in fact, I learned several things. Even at my advancing age, which then I guess was about 56 or 57, 
After more than 40 years as a professional composer, I learned some basic lessons about the field. First, I learned the power of collaboration. I was paired with a superb librettist named Gene Shear, S-C-H-E-E-R, -E without whom I could not have done the project at all, never mind done it well. Second, I learned about the importance of publicity. Until then, I had never thought of myself as being in show business, capital S, capital B. But mind you, we had the following to work with, a confusing subject and a mysterious title, August 4th, 1964. We had an out of the way and conservative venue, Dallas, largely invisible to the national media and seemingly irrelevant to the larger world of orchestral music. But my managers and publicists, a group called the 20, 21C Media Group, did prove that if you can get people to attend to, to read about, to focus on what you're doing just for a moment, then they might not only come to the performance, but think about it, feel it, and debate it. The first thing they did was to get a large feature in the New York Times on the Sunday before the weekend of my uh, premiere. And they got the New York Times to send a reviewer and to write a long review. The second thing they did was to make a little homemade film and put it on YouTube as a kind of trailer. It is my duty to the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. We started with simply the assignment to do something about President Johnson. This was the vision of the Dallas Symphony that uh, to mark the the occasion of uh, the centenary, which is actually August of 2008. On August 4th, 1964, two major events in LBJ's presidency collided. It was the, the Gulf of Tonkin and the discovery of Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman's bodies, these three civil rights workers who had been missing all summer. It's a kind of iconic moment in uh, the development of America, and you can summarize the big events of that year on a single day, August 4th, 1964. Uh, LBJ received word around 8 o'clock at night that the, um, uh, the three bodies of these three civil rights workers, Shorner, Cheney, and Goodman, had been discovered. These three young men, Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner, both from New York City, and James Cheney, who was from Mississippi itself, had joined CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, and were going to work for them for the summer. And they were registering black voters in Mississippi. Yeah. But on June 21st, Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman went to uh, look at a church that had been burned. They were taken by uh, the cops into a, a local uh, jail. They were released about five hours later. The police were in cahoots with uh, members of the KKK, and they were ultimately murdered that night. August 4th, 1964. I was at a, at a meeting at a church, and um, they got a call. My mother told them to bring me home. And everybody in the house was crying. The television was on. Uh, you can see this, this picture on the, on the screen. Three bodies being put into a hearse. At 8 o'clock at night, when LBJ is called by Hoover's assistant and told that the bodies had been discovered, um, he's asked whether they should go public with that information. And LBJ really responds to, as a sort of a kind human being and says, no, we can't do that. It's, uh, we have to notify the families first. On August 4th, I, I was home. This was 44 days after my brother and James Cheney and Michael Schroeder were first missing. And we got a call from Lyndon Johnson. He was on the phone. He said, this is the President of the United States. Said, who are you? And he said, I have some really bad news for you. And, uh, we found the bodies of your brother, James Cheney and Michael Schroeder, and we want you to know before we say anything publicly. On the same day, uh, early in the morning, LBJ got a call that the Maddox and the Turner Joy were under threat of being attacked. Secretary McNamara, Lano. Good President, we just had word by telephone from Admiral Sharp that the uh, destroyer is under torpedo attack. Now, where are these torpedoes coming from? Well, we don't know. Presumably from these unidentified craft that I mentioned to you a moment ago. Robert McNamara was the Secretary of Defense in the Johnson administration. And he was, if not the architect of the 
U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War, certainly its CEO. Uh, during the course of the day, you hear in these phone conversations McNamara and LBJ um, struggling, wrestling with what to do uh, in response to this attack that they uh, assumed had taken place. They misinterpreted this as an attack which in fact had not happened. And we can only speculate how history might have developed otherwise if, um, if that interpretation had been better. At 11.32 that night, LBJ went on TV and told the nation that an attack was underway. Undoubtedly, the fact that two of the missing men were white and were from New York City, so that their hometown paper was the New York Times, made it into a bigger national story than it might have been. The president used that to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Vietnam sort of eclipsed all of the, a lot of the good he did with the Great Society and with the civil rights. It's just an amazing story, and it got lost in the sauce. It's a Shakespearean tragedy. And the fact that it happened at the same time that another national tragedy was unfolding, the, the ramping up of the Vietnam War into something that was going to turn out quite, in a, quite a complicated and bad way, makes that a kind of iconic day, you know, f focusing so many feelings and ideas and issues that we all lived with in the 60s and that we're still living with the consequences of. By the way, I didn't write that music either, uh, but I, d I did discover watching them make this video that you can't do film without musical underscoring. The images and the words don't actually engage uh, if there's no music. And so this sort of ambient wallpaper, idea-free music was whatever the video editor had lying around, but it makes all the difference. The publicist understood that this is how you announce something that you want noticed these days. These, these same folks, by the way, went on to manage the YouTube Symphony Project a few months ago. Just to summarize some of the key events of 1964 and 1965. Uh, the summer of 64 was Freedom Summer. The southern U.S. was flooded with local black activists and northern white activists. Um, here's a kind of timeline, uh, mixing together events um, having to do with civil rights and race relations and events having to do with Vietnam. How did Gene Shear make these two streams of apparently unrelated events into a dramatic, coherent, emotionally resonant whole? I'm going to show you an overview of the libretto, which altogether is 12 numbers. Um, and I have I have put in red and uh, italics the, the numbers which advance the narrative of, of the events of August 1964. The blue uh, Roman um, events are, as it were, sidebars. They are context um, uh, for, for the actual narrative. Dealing with this libretto, I just, uh, actually let me show you page two. So that's the, the 12 movement structure. Dealing with this libretto, I discovered empirically certain ancient truths one might have thought irrelevant to a child of the late 20th century, especially that such a large structure needs to be clarified by recurring musical topics, themes, leitmotifs even. This approach wasn't pre-planned by me. I discovered it as I went. It was a natural response to the need to make the experience clear, urgent, expressive. Suddenly one understood why Wagner's attaching advertising jingles to every character and idea in his operas was not merely expedient or lazy or cheap, but utterly necessary. And as I say, these topics weren't really planned in advance, but, uh, but, but they developed as I went. Um, the uh, music having to do with the mother's lamentation and a traditional, in fact, even Baroque and Renaissance uh, musical motif of a descending half step, a sigh. Um, the music of the Oval Office, which is a kind of busy, you know, workaday music. The music for a poem of Stephen Spender that becomes prominent. The poem, I think, continually of those who were truly great. A music for Johnson's compassionate side, which was an important part of his character. Uh, a number of allusions to We Shall Overcome, which you'll, the, the civil rights anthem, which you'll hear. A kind of march music, which is not only for wartime situations, but for marsh, the, the martial feeling of trying to do something right. Uh, a kind of noble, innocent music that's associated with the three boys. And the music of vainglory, which I think will be very clear when you hear it. Um, notice how deeply conventional 
most of these topics are. Now, I'd like to sample with you several of the movements in order to do several things. First, to savor some details of Gene Shear's excellent libretto. And second, to sample some of the recurring topics I've just mentioned. And finally, if we're really lucky, to raise some useful questions about style, personal voice, the role of so-called classical music in 21st century society, and ultimately, I suppose, questions of modernism, postmodernism, and perhaps neither or other. The first movement uh, juxtaposes three points of view. The first is that of Mrs. Goodman and Mrs. Cheney, two of the grieving mothers. Uh, Mrs. Goodman is mezzo-soprano Kelly O'Connor. Mrs. Cheney is soprano Laquita Mitchell. You'll hear right away the two-note psi motif, and we're listening to the portion that's in yellow. Secondly, uh, in this three point of view, first movement, the stark contrast when we cut from the lamentation of the mothers to the Oval Office, busy, busy, men at work. McNamara is tenor veil right out. And if those few of you who are reading scores, this is bar 97 in the first movement. I remember the day that Gene Shear first showed me a mock-up of this scene. It was the first thing he ever showed me. I had, been, I had remained deeply, deeply skeptical of this project right up until that moment. And we met in an Upper West Side coffee shop that was our office for a few years. 
Um, and he had the granola and I had the oatmeal, or sometimes we would switch. Um, and he handed this over and I got goosebumps and I got tears because um, of the master stroke that he discovered that Caroline Goodman, the mother of uh, Andrew Goodman, had told the New York Times on, I think, August 9th, I don't know if it says here, that, um, that when she heard about her son's body being discovered, she taped this poem on the wall of her apartment and made a little shrine. And it remained there until, I believe, 2007, when she died on West 86th Street. That shrine was up all that time. And so this poem of Stephen Spender becomes a kind of third point of view. It's always a cappella. Uh, it frames, in a way, the whole enterprise, because it appears prominently here in the first movement and then again as the main material in the, in the last movement, number 12, with references elsewhere in between. This is bar 153 in the first movement. I promise you I'll go back and pick up that line, who from the womb remembered the soul's history. It, 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 it will appear. The libretto, and so too the music, have almost no jokes, as you can imagine. There's not, there are no light spots much in this piece. Only when, at the start of the second movement, LBJ, who's been absent from movement one, is discovered on the other side of the stage, complaining as so often about how poorly appreciated his efforts have been and how little respect he gets from what he regards as the elite Eastern establishment. All the historians are Harvard people. It just isn't fair. This is an example of a sidebar, as I call it, the, not advancing the main narrative, that is the actual events of August 1964, but providing a richer context for them. In the middle of this movement, two more topics, musical topics, are introduced. The, what I call the compassion music, and a reference to a once universally known civil rights anthem, We Shall Overcome. There is, by the way, no other period music anywhere in this piece, even by allusion, but this particular souvenir, cultural souvenir, is referred to several times. Here's the middle section. This is from Doris Carnes book, Goodwin's uh, uh, biography of LBJ, which is based on interviews you know, that she did at the ranch just uh, after he retired. She spent quite a bit of that time that he was, he lived down there, what, three or four years before dying only, um, uh, talking to him. And this is from one of those interviews. 
If you listen very carefully, you'll hear a, a small reference to We Shall Overcome, I think. much yet. By the way, the, the baritone, President Johnson, is, uh, is Robert Orth from near Chicago. Now, movements three, six, and nine, which have the titles Oval Office one, two, and three, form the spine of the Vietnam strand of the narrative. Here's a sample. And this gives us a sample of the so-called Oval Office musical topic. We won't have time to sample the music of the so-called noble innocent strand that's associated with Michael Schwerner um, and Andrew Goodman, but it turns up mainly in movements four and eight. I'll let you see the text of number four. This is from Michael Schwerner's essay, application essay to work for CORE in the summer of 1964. It's, it's really very sweet and very noble. How Gene found all, well, I know how he found it all. He found it in the LBJ Library where you can find just about anything if you have a few weeks. It's a quite amazing resource. Much of this material is online if you know how to look. Now, in March 1965, LBJ gave a historic speech to Congress urging passage of the Voting Rights Act, which finally did pass a few months later in the summer of 65. Mind you, the speaker, LBJ, is a racist, or at best a reformed racist from the Hill Country of Texas. Mind you, he said at the time that by forcing the voting rights issue, he and the Democrats were handing the South over to the Republican Party for the next 40 years. He was right about that. He only got the time wrong. He had it too short. The act itself was drafted by Judge Barefoot Sanders, the Voting Rights Act. I do not know who wrote the speech, but it may have been Harry Middleton, who's still alive in Austin, Texas, whom I've met and talked to, and who was the first director of the LBJ Library. But it was LBJ himself who penciled in the words, and we shall overcome, in the limo on the way to Capitol Hill. Gene Shear turns, that, uh, turns bits of that speech into an aria for Johnson, Movement 5. And I'll play uh, just the beginning of Movement 5. You're going to hear an immediate allusion to we shall overcome. Again, a little bit on the subtle side.
national rights only human rights It was Gene Shear's brilliant idea too to interweave LBJ's 1965 speech with a Cheney family story, you can see the beginning of it at the bottom of the slide, in which James Cheney's father, a successful black farmer in Mississippi, angered the white farmers in the area by refusing to sell out to them. So they kidnapped him and they murdered him, as their grandchildren would do to his own grandson decades later, just a few miles away. Some more of this story and some more of the intercutting of the speech. At times, history and fate meet at a single time and place to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. So it was in Lexington and Concord. So it was a century ago at Appomattox. So it was last week in Selma, Alabama. It's a good speech. Johnson was not a good speech maker. He was not an eloquent writer. His writers weren't very eloquent either most of the time, and he was not good at delivering speeches. But he, um, this is a famous moment when he, he did what had to be done. And at that famous moment when he inserted the electrifying phrase, we shall overcome, which standing in the well of the Congress in 1965, uh, of a white former Senate majority leader from the Hill Country of Texas was as good as saying, I'm a black man today. It was that a dramatic a moment. When that happens in the musical setting, the we shall overcome strand of the musical fabric that has been percolating, we've only heard a couple of instances, culminates in a very obvious way and then disappears from the piece forever. You're also going to hear some dotted march rhythms that come from that resolute march topic that I mentioned. Beginning at the text, it is not just Negroes, but all of us. This is bar 111 in movement five. Should we double our wealth and conquer the stars and still be unequal to this issue, then we will have failed as a people and a nation. It is not just Negroes, but all of us must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry. Now for a minute these musical topics that we've been talking about. Lamentation, the Oval Office music, the Stephen Spender poem, and so on. Uh, one or two we haven't heard yet, but we're about to. And to review where we are now in the cycle of the 12 movements, here again is a, an overview of the libretto. So we've come to movement five, there, there is more Oval Office business in movement six, and then there's a break in, uh, in movement seven for uh, an all orchestral elegy. Not a specific elegy, not, a spe not an elegy for this person or that person, for this idea or that idea, but by this time, 30 minutes into the piece, we have plenty to be elegiac about. Movement uh, eight, 
is, I think, another stroke of genius by Scheer. He found a postcard that Andrew Goodman wrote home to his parents on the very day he died. It's dear mom and dad, the weather is beautiful, the people are nice, I wish you were here. He, was, he had been dead for several days when they received this. The music is, uh, is related to Michael Schwerner's noble, innocent, innocent music in, in Movement 4. Now, the Vietnam action continues in Movement 9. It's what Gene and I call our fog of war movement. The participants are Robert McNamara, President Johnson. The chorus is reading, so to speak, cables relayed from the Pacific Theater to the Department of Defense to the White House. A very confusing welter of cables and, uh, and other, other communication traffic. Here's how that begins. McNamara saying, we must be damn sure about what happened. Keep me informed of what comes in. And then the chorus reads these cables. Uh, and the whole thing is, is, is quite active and confusing, as probably it was. The best sample of this fog of war scene that I can offer you combines the confused, unreliable reporting from the field done by the chorus with McNamara's bravado in the face of the imagined enemy, and then with McNamara and Johnson together rehearsing each other on what to say on TV that night when they announced their new bombing campaign. This is in Movement 9 from Bar 76. glory topic you've been waiting for. Um, you notice the Dallas Symphony Chorus is wonderful. 200 volunteers, uh, none of them paid. They worked for several weeks. It was interesting to me to see how many of the chorus were deeply, deeply engaged in this subject. They were people my age or slightly younger. And of course they're from Dallas where they watched Johnson become president in November 1963. Uh, it means a lot to them. And it was interesting also to learn that a number of members of the chorus decided not to participate in this concert for whatever reasons. Because the material meant too much to them, either in a negative or a positive way, I suppose. But um, Dallas is an interesting place to do a project like this. Um, there's what we just heard at uh, the beginning of the rehearsing the TV speech. The crux of the August 4th action, though, came in the evening of that awful day. About 8 o'clock, the FBI called the president to say that they had found and identified the bodies, and he called the Goodman and Schwerner households. In Mississippi, 
The Cheney family had already heard from the FBI firsthand, of course. During the 44 days that the bodies had been missing, the FBI had discovered no fewer than 76 other bodies buried in Mississippi. The Cheneys were used to them knocking on the door with a piece of clothing and saying, did this belong to James? No. On August 4th, the answer was yes. And then three hours later, US bombers were headed for Vietnam and the president was explaining his decision to the American people on the air just before midnight, August 4th. Um, this material comes now in movement 10. First, the mother's point of view, strongly conditioned by their lamentation style that we heard in the first movement. And then Johnson reacting to the FBI using his compassion music. I think you need to hold the announcement. We ought to notify these families. It might kind of ease it a little bit. This is uh, the beginning of movement 10. And then the climax. Notice now that when the president does go on TV, the musical topic we're calling Vainglory, of course, takes over again. But after each triumphal, self-satisfied major triad, the orchestra immediately begins to curdle into something more ambiguous, not at all self-assured or optimistic. R79. Watching. 
to hear the rest of that text that Johnson was just delivering. This Wagnerian atmosphere is ironic, but it's also not ironic. It is a solemn responsibility, and it is a complicated situation, and I myself don't know how I feel about it exactly. You can also see now the text of Movement 11. Whoops. Yeah, on the same slide. The text of Movement 11, in which McNamara is redeemed both vocally because it's the first time he's freed from the hyperactive managerial patter that was his war room style. And if you like personally, although that's controversial, because he is humanized at last by admitting his mistakes, by admitting that decisions that were made that day and in those months to follow affected the lives of 58,000 Americans and 3.7 million Vietnamese, not to mention a few people from a few other countries. The finale, but a retrospective, bittersweet finale it is, includes, as conventionally it must, a quartet for the soloists. But it's really the chorus who dominate the close, returning to their Stephen Spender. At the outset, I used the subtitle, A Composer Confronts His History. What did I mean? This project proved to be an important voyage of self-discovery for me. I went into it, so to speak, holding my nose. More than a year later, I emerged from it profoundly moved and I hope changed. I'm a child of the 60s. When John F. Kennedy was murdered, I had just turned 14. On August 4th, 1964, I was still 14. During the, during the Watts riots in 1965, I was 15. During the Detroit riots of 1967, I was 17. During the police riots at the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago and the assassination of Martin Luther King and the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, I was 18. Every American of my generation was shaped by those events. At that age, those events shook us hard, penetrated us deeply, and lodged permanently. I had been carrying them around all these years and carrying around my feelings about my fellow Texan, LBJ, in a state of arrested development. On those supercharged topics, I was still a teenager. The Dallas Symphony and Gene Shear forced me to confront that personal history, in effect to grow up, to come to a more nuanced, perhaps more mature understanding of the complexity of LBJ's situation and his character, and the complexities of our national agonies in those crucial years. I'm a child of the 1960s in another way, of course. When I came of age as a composer, my guides were Xenakis, Lutoslavsky, Ligeti, Berio, Boulez. However my musical language has evolved over the ensuing 40 years, I have never stopped thinking of my heritage as fully rooted in the same soil as the two great flowerings of modernism in the 20th century. First that of Schoenberg, Stravinsky, and Bartok in the teens and 20s, and then that of the post-1945 avant-garde, so-called. For example, I still have to think of the side to composers. Uh, for, I still have to think about it every time I write an octave. I still keep one eye on the aggregate at all times. But composing August 4th, 1964, I found that I did not have the luxury of indulging my pet assumptions about modern music. 
I could have taken this libretto by Gene Shear. I could have set the words, it was the saddest moment of my life, the day they found my son's body, to music like Nono's Il Canto Sospeso or Lachenmann's Little Match Girl Opera, to name just two powerful works on equally tragic material. But to me, this material dictated otherwise. It just wouldn't allow me to make this project about my own cleverness or my own alienation or my own modernist language. Instinct took over instead, and I used a language, or rather a set of languages, that the material seemed to force out of me. The results surprised even me. First, most of the music, as you, see, as you noticed, is tonal, even, you might say, populist. Second, the musical topics are strongly conventional. The two-note size, the dotted march rhythms, a secret chorale that emerges from the musical fabric, rather like what happens in the Berg Violin Concerto, and so on. And third, a style of choral writing in the Spender poem that I've known how to do since I was about 15 years old. In the end, then, I have been forced to confront my own history both as a thinking, feeling human being and as a musician, and to confront the continuing relevance of historical models, even the very notion, antique as it sounds, of the oratorial as a genre. None of this is polemical for me. The New York Times and all the Texas news newspapers wanted desperately for Gene and me to relate the content of our piece to the administration of another Texan president who was in office in September 2008. We steadfastly refused. People should make these connections for themselves if they want to, of course, but for us as the authors to make them limits, diminishes the impact and universality we hope for. Similarly, to write in styles that I've known since my youth is not for me a statement about musical politics or repudiation of modernism, which I still consider my home country, or a populist attempt to cultivate a broader public. It is simply the only response that felt right to me in the face of these events and these almost overwhelmingly powerful words. Indeed, in the very next piece I wrote, I swung all the way to the other end of my own stylistic spectrum with a huge sense of relief. It was liberating to be free of this overwhelming emotional burden. And that next piece has in it not one bar of tonal music, at least not in my opinion. We'll hear it tomorrow night, some of us. It's called Rhapsodies. It will be played by the University Orchestra tomorrow night. But the point is not choosing one end of that spectrum or the other. The point is embracing the whole spectrum as authentically my own. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now I see a lady with a microphone, so. Uh. <laughs> I'm happy to entertain any, uh, any questions or brickbats for that matter. Hi. Uh, uh, my name is James Bunch. I'm a composition student here. Hello. Uh, thanks for coming and sharing your music you. with us. Uh, during the, the uh, Oval Office scenes, the parts that were leading up to uh, talk about the Vietnam War, um, I noticed a lot of, and maybe this was just in my own head, a lot of similarities to trumpet licks from the Dies Irae from the Britain War Requiem. And I was wondering if that sort of world of writing or that piece in particular had an influence on you when you were writing this piece. And uh, yeah, so that's a good place as any. That's a terrific question and I'll give you an honest answer, uh, as honest as I can make it. Um, while thinking about this piece, before we even had a topic, except LBJ, as unpromising as that sounded, um, I, was, I was thinking most about what not to do. I was I was keenly aware that one could write the war requiem on this occasion and then one, one shouldn't. <laughs> and I was keenly aware that one could write Nixon in China on this occasion and that one shouldn't do that either. Um, I, think I, uh, I think having those um, negative models, or the very positive models in my head, but wishing to avoid them, um, I did in fact stray close to, the, to Britain in the dotted march rhythms, which are 
a little bit like uh, the War Requiem. Although if you write March Rhythm, they all turn out about the same, it's true. But one does think because of the brass scoring and the sort of triadic, more or less triadic arpeggiations of Britain there, so do I. And I think about Adams a little bit in the busy music of the Oval Office, although I tried to make it as un-Adams-like as I could. Nevertheless, it's, you know, it's, in the same, it's in the same ballpark. John hasn't heard this yet. I haven't admitted to him that I wrote the piece yet. So. <laughs> Although I think the cat is out of the bag, uh, the the orchestral elegy which you haven't heard was played on Thursday night last week as a standalone piece by the Berkeley Symphony. Uh, John Adams' wife is on the board of the Berkeley Symphony, and she was at the concert, and she liked it, and she told him. So I guess now I'm going to have to have a discussion about Nixon versus Johnson. Thanks. I have a question about the architecture of the piece. How was it mostly Gene giving you a structure and you said, aha, I can do this, this, and this? Or did you tell Gene, I really need something at around 50 minutes? Or, you know what I mean? Um, I never told Gene I needed anything because Gene knew what I needed better than I knew. He's very experienced. He, he, uh, this is not a stage piece per se, although the next performances of it, the next performance of it, just one, I think, in November of 2010 is meant to be a little more staged, apparently, I'm told. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'm, I wrote it as a stand and sing piece. Um, I found the structure pretty inspiring already. Um, but two stories about how it unfolded. It took Gene a long time to come to this topic. And when he came to it, it was a good one. But then it took him a long time to flesh it out, a lot, weeks and weeks sitting in Austin, Texas you know, looking, at, looking through the archives during the day and eating barbecue at night. Uh, and um, I was looking at the, I was watching the clock and calculating how much music I was going to have to write, you know, per day in order to, in order to deliver this uh, 65 or 70 minute piece. And I was getting very nervous. And so I wrote the orchestral interlude, which we had already decided we should have first. And then, and then the first half of the libretto arrived. I didn't actually know exactly how the, the structure of the second half of the libretto while writing the first half. But the, but the alternation of topics that's built in is, I think, good enough that if you follow it, you, you begin to make a decent structure. The other story is that it was an 11-movement piece, not a 12-movement piece. And at, at the 11th hour, at, at 11.59 on my compositional clock, Gene calls and says, you know, we have to put in another movement for McNamara. And I nearly went into the street and threw myself in front of a car, you know, really. I, I had, been, I had just about survived this process, and then, you know, uh, the horse could see the barn, you know, and was <laughs> straining at the bit. But he was right. The, uh, I didn't play it for you, but the, the short movement in which McNamara says we were wrong, uh, both musically and, um, and in terms of the human drama, uh, turned out to be necessary. While I've got the mic, I should mention that actually Gene Shear, the librettist for this piece, is going to be here in March giving another Millercom lecture on the same series. So I hope to see you all there. He's a terrific person. It'll be a great lecture. He's also fearless. He's made, just made an opera of Moby Dick. <laughs> um, and it'll be premiered at the new opera house in Dallas at the end of April, beginning of May. Way. <laughs> well, I would have said no, but you know, it's it's now a couple of years since I stopped work on it, and I'm a, I'm still breathing. So it's a. Um, there's talk about an opera. Gene and I would like to do an opera together because I enjoyed working with him. We enjoyed working together so much. We don't really have a topic yet, although as I, I probably shouldn't be too indiscreet about this. We have some ideas. Uh, it was proposed to us that we try to get the rights and make a film based, uh, make a make a, an opera based on the East German film, the, the Lives of Others. I think that's it's it's a very intriguing idea. You, 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 I don't know if you remember this film about um, the interactions of the Stasi with with normal people and how that plays out years later. Um, it's a very promising topic. We're probably not going to get the rights, which is a relief to me because I have no idea what to do with it. But you know, you have no idea what to do with anything until you do it, I guess. So 
Um, I'm urging on Gene some novels of Jose Saramago, which seems to me would make very interesting operatic vehicles. We talked about the unbearable lightness of being. We probably couldn't get it, and we probably shouldn't do it since everyone likes the film. Uh, but Yeah, I'll probably end up ruining about three years of my life sometime on an opera. But it'll be a pleasure to ruin it with Gene. <laughs> Since you talked about uh, returning to your own style in the subsequent piece in Rhapsodies, or at least to your, what you consider your modernist roots, do you see ever combining them in a piece? Well, you know, if, if when I listen carefully to August 4th, I hear um, all the orchestral devices that I use in every piece. Um, and it's, it's, it's mainly a matter of tweaking the language slightly in the direction of tonality. My harmonic language is, um, is almost always organized more or less like this, uh, in, in the kind of arpeggiated, you know, third-based uh, ch chains of intervals, and, <laughs> um, sorry, and uh, uh, so it's, it's actually a short trip for me from materials which seem to serve an atonal context and which seem to serve a tonal one. It's the same in the second concerto we listened to this, this morning. There are, you know, uh, essentially tonal, tonal materials at some points, and in fact, the, the last movement ends in the key of B, uh, more or less, you know. So uh, it's not such a long drive. Also, the, the, the real story is that uh, I, I got this New York Phil Commission during composing the Dallas piece, and I was sorely tempted to say no, but they promised me a premiere at the proms in London, a European tour, and then a US premiere with Lauren Mazel on the first concert of the season. And so at some point in the middle of August 4th, I suspended work and with great relief, went over to this other piece for about five weeks, I guess, wrote it as fast as possible, and then went back to the went back to Johnson and McNamara, you know. But that's probably the only thing that saved my life was writing Rhapsodies in the middle. Do you see the possibility in uh, the music scene in the United States of somebody really uh, addressing and owning the history of the United States in, say, a way similar to like Noam Chomsky has in writing about the United States? So writing music that is not necessarily f uh, totally affirmative about our history as a country, right. or that is actually really critical of it, and that ha having uh, an effect and having a place in, in places like uh, uh, the programming of the New York Philharmonic and other institutions like that. Well, it, it, the situation is a little complicated. I can tell you a couple of stories. I mean, first of all, as you know, that, that there's, there is this deep-seated institutional conflict that institutions are um, conservative, not essentially for political reasons, but for economic reasons. And that it's difficult to imagine the New York Philharmonic risking a few hundred thousand dollars uh, on, um, on a truly controversial piece. On the other hand, they commissioned from Thomas Adash a piece called America, which is a truly controversial piece for the, for the uh, millennium. And he delivered it, and people kind of took it. Not too well, but it's been revived now by other orchestras. We played it in LA last season uh, where uh, it still makes people sit up and say, oh my God, did he actually say that? But in a way that I thought was bracing and really positive. So, uh, of course, Adesh has a lot of clout and he can kind of do what he wants to. The question is, you and me, uh, can we do that? It, in this case, um, that's not how this that's not how this project turned out, not because we were avoiding controversy, but because we I don't think we take a point of view, and I don't think I take a point of view in the music most of the time. It's possible, for example, to interpret all that Johnson music on TV as ironic or not ironic, as, as being critical of Johnson's performance or as affirming it. Um, I, I don't really mind which interpretation pe people take. There, there is now um, quite a lot of activity in a kind of oratorial-like form. Um, using political, historical, and cultural topics. Uh, Houston Symphony um, commissioned a big piece by Christopher Theophanidis a year or two ago. I think it was Chris, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, 
involving immigrant culture, uh, stories of immigrant cultures. Uh, and, uh, it, there seems to be an interest in this side. I think, the, I think the conflict is that it's very hard to get somebody to pay for something that, that is truly hard hitting. But we can hope, we can hope. Well, I appreciate your goodwill and your attention, and thank you very much for having me.